Well, I figured I preached this uh, sermon a lot of other places, and, and I don't remember recall ever doing it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach Bad Bob this morning. And uh, so it's a testimonial sermon, and maybe you'll get something out of it. I hope you do. So, Bad Bob. Mm-mm-mm. So I hope it doesn't diminish my uh, authority as a pastor, and you don't think ill of me when you hear everything, but... Uh, this is who you got as a pastor, amen? So I'll go through all this as quickly as I can, and then there's a little three-point thing at the end of it, and I uh, hope you'd listen. And there's anybody here not saved, and uh, I don't know who you are, but you can get saved today, amen? Right, amen. Okay, 1950, that's 57 years ago. No dad. You know what that means? Well, how did you, what are you, virgin born? No. What that means is didn't have a married person in the family. So the definition of a boy being born out of wedlock is a bastard, according to the Bible. So you're looking at, it's Bad Bob, you know, it was Tiger Bob in the club, it's Bad Bob on the track, but it was the other B-Bob, you know, when I was born. And they say, oh, that, you shouldn't talk like that, it's a fact. So no dad, had two names, my birth name was Fielding, stepdad uh, and legal marriage, changed it to How. H-O-W-E, wasn't adopted by him, but they allowed me to use that name in school because of uh, him marrying my mother. 1963, mother remarried, and I was adopted and received uh, the name I have now, No Gal Ski. I was brought up in a poor section of Detroit, most years in a housing project called the Herman Gardens. In 1964, I went forward in a Baptist church and received the Lord. Calvary Baptist of Dearborn Heights, Michigan, Earl Jones, pastor. It was a suburban church, and distance kept me from attending. After a while, the saved presence and that feeling, you know, went away as I hung around the same friends, and I'll return to this later. In 1969, uh, uh, got married. In 1969, went to jail for what I did in 67. 1974, jailhouse conversion, I call it, according to Peter's conversion definition. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ told Peter, uh, uh, after you've been converted, strengthen the brethren. So I'm using that in that regard. In 1976, uh, began serving the Lord. My wife and I were baptized. 1977, Bible College. 1978, children began to be born. 1981, First Church, Fundamental Baptist. 1989, Second Church, Anchor Baptist. 1993, Third Church, Victory Baptist. And that's something. Ten children, four married, three grandchildren, another due in March. Got five boys. Timothy, a uh, Marine Captain, Intelligence. Nehemiah, an RN, working on passing his MD uh, testing. Uh, Levi is a senior in Christian college. Samuel waiting to get into college for teaching history, as far as I know. So far, so good. Isaiah called to preach. Uh, last, uh, his last year of high school, uh, he will go off to college. A uh, charity's uh, school teacher. Pregnant, my princess. Uh, Melody is college grad with elementary teaching secretarial. Just had a baby girl, my pumpkin. Susanna going to school for RN, into martial arts, and works at credit union. That's my precious. Kezi in high school, loves the Lord. She's my pretty. Joanna, 11 years old, almost, going on 30. She's my petunia and cutie. Married to the same woman, by the grace of and mercy of God, since 1969, May 17th. Now, I'll break it down alphabetically. A. Baptized Catholic, Roman, Latin era, Vatican I, 1950. That's what they tell me. I mean, I, know, I think I was there. I got godparents or something. B. Made my Holy Communion. C. Made my confirmation at Father G. Bald School, 1963. Father G. Bald School is a school for boys in Terrell, Indiana, where I was also an altar boy. D. Calvary Baptist Church, 1964. The preaching of the thief on the cross got me under conviction. I went forward at 14 years old and received Jesus Christ. I felt great. I had relief and peace. E. Between 11 years old and 1963... I was in the youth home 11 times. F, at age 13, in the boys' home one year. That was Father G. Ball School for Boys. G, at age 18, 90 days in jail. 
Age 24, another 90 days, with a total of eight years probation, or paper we call it. H, multiple incarcerations with no convictions. Lawyers. I, I, motorcycle club from 20 years old to 26 years old. Partying 24 hours, seven days a week, from age 17 to 26. J, sniff glue and drank at 11 years old. K, used speed at 13 and added Mary Jane, which is marijuana, at 14 years old. L, 17 years old to 26, heroin, downers, uppers, hallucinogenics, PCB, P, angel dust, and things we mixed and made up. Now, what was that? A life of fantasy, self-indulgence, self-gratification, violence, and hate. A ghetto environment, a broken home, a dysfunctional life. My friends were like-minded and tough as nails. No snitches, no chickens, no hope. In other words, you didn't tell anyone, you did whatever you were dared, and you could care less because you believed you were dying before you got old. From 14 years of age on, I got caught for everything. It was like I had bad luck. In 1974, I was put in jail where I started a fire, hence the Bad Bob track by Brother Chick that I used for my testimony. It is a miracle I didn't die. I cried out to God and told him I was sorry. Something again happened to me. I was in a sound mind and full of peace. While in jail, I heard the word backslidden for the first time, read my Bible through first time, read several Hal Lindsey books, and stopped smoking cigarettes. In jail. Yeah. Now, I know you won't believe this, but it's true. I was vice president of this bike club, so they had a party for me when I got back. Full of booze, dope. The weirdest thing happened. I started telling them about the rapture and things for the next... Uh, you know, year and, a, and one half was awfully strange. I felt uneasy doing things unless I was wasted out of my mind. Finally, in June of 1976, I overdosed on drugs, went next door for help. Mr. Daniel Stewart was a Baptist that went to Temple Baptist Church in Detroit, uh, the one J. Frank Norris started. He told me I was backslidden and what that meant. He told me I needed to go to church. I went back to my house my house straight, God took the overdose away. When I got home, it was as if there was someone holding a shotgun to the back of my head and a loud voice said, out of the club now or you're dead. Boy, I can still hear it. I went to the president's house and he said, Tiger, what do you want? I says, I'm out and gave him my patch, which is our colors and belt buckle. He stared weird at me and said, what are you, high on cuckoo dust? I said, no. Have you ever read the Bible? He said, get out of here. Well, I did, and it's been since 1976. Now, I've been back to do several funerals and counsel with a couple of them and even marry one. They know I'm for real. I don't have to dress like them or smell like them to do it. Now, God got me in my right mind. God clothed me different. God sent me in another direction. So I asked you today, what's your excuse? What's your background? What's your life like? Now, would you now let me give you some things I have learned? Well, I'm even going to do it, even if you don't. Some might be helped today. But if you saw all those things or listened to all those things I just said, naturally I could take hours explaining each individual one. So unless you've been there and done that, you really may not have an idea of everything that goes on, but it makes a toll on your brain, on your body, on your soul. So that's why some people say, well, preacher, you think you know everything. No, but I can spot certain things. Been there and done that. Uh, they say, well, preacher, you still think you know everything. Do I? Well, what are the things that you think I know that I shouldn't know? Then you have to ask your question, why in the world, after hearing a testimony like that, would God use somebody like that? And why in the world are we sitting here listening to some nut like this? But God puts things together. People need each other. There's a reason for that. And um, so that's why 
Uh, we try to help. I tried to rear my kids to where they would. Uh, uh, I took them to rescue missions. I took them to convalesce. I took them everywhere that I could. I wasn't afraid about taking my kids, getting them into ministry, getting them involved. I made them do that. Do you hear me? I made them do it. A lot of times they did it because, you know, they, they're obeying me out of fear. But I think a lot of times they just did it because they started enjoying it on and off. But they did it out of fear most of the time. And as baby Christians, guess how you serve God? You serve God out of fear. It grows into love. And the habits that you uh, uh, create when you're younger, guess what? They form your life later on. Uh, so, so when it gets into homeschooling, when it gets into, uh, uh, you know, even, even uh, you women going through pregnancy, you know, a wife having ten children with the background that we had, uh, she may have something on the ball. She just may know something, you know. And, 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 and she's not uh, your outspoken um, Delta wolf or alpha dog, you know, because there's some personalities that women just like to take over and just do everything. My wife was just more concerned about pleasing me and uh, not getting involved because she didn't want me to be mad at her stirring up anything in the church because she sees how that happens sometimes with pastor's wives. So whatever she does, she doesn't do it intentionally. She does it because she loves people. And she's been a perfect wife to me, I think. And she's backed me, and I'm still here. Amen? And she knows my background. And I can remember coming here. I can remember how mean I was. And I'm better now, ain't I, Mike? Lie, Mike. And, uh, I mean, but God, you know what? God knew my character and knew I had to be tough. Because there were some hard heads out there sometimes. And so he put a hard head here. But when you start considering all that stuff, being told to pray to a father and I didn't have a father, how in the world am I going to handle that? When you're telling me about all this relationship of a daddy and kids and going fishing and going all that stuff, I got no concept of that. All right? No concept. That's why my kids, hopefully when they get older, they'll be able to spend more time with their kids with sports and other I'm just not into that. The only sports I've ever done was in jail. The most games I ever played was in jail. So every time I play a game or do anything like that, guess what I think of? Juvenile or jail. You say, well, that's all a psychological block. Yeah, I know, but that's part of my makeup. You know, so when you understand my past, you can at least see a little bit here. And so you've got to be a little merciful and gracious on your preacher in some areas because you'll say, well, he said, no, 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 you don't understand. And who knows what that stuff did to my body and my head? I have no idea. But God does. So when you consider these things, then you know why I'm a little bit light when it comes to excuses. Because I hear these excuses all the time and I'll look. And also I can sm spot a spoiled brat right off the bat because I was spoiled. That's how this whole thing began. Mother, no daddy. So I know what spoiled brats are like. And so the thing that gets people more upset is when they're found out and when the truth goes forth and they're put on the spot saying you're mad because you're not getting your way. Then that upsets them. Well, how do you know? You're just judging. Yeah, okay. All right, cool. Amen. So there's some traits that I have that God uses through my personality to inflict, inflict great bodily harm to you. Amen. Well, that's not very nice. That's what God does. If you're not stirred up, you won't do nothing. You won't even check yourself out. As soon as we get a job, we start making money, we just float back into the routine again. Until he shakes us up, we don't get serious about him. And I'm telling you, after all these years, since 1976, I've had a lot of shake-ups. And it ain't stopped. So what do you do? You trust God. Now, let me give you three things here today. And I know I'm being a little short, and I hope I'm, I don't shorten it too long. But if you can just put all that stuff together... You know, if some of my makeup, then you'll get an idea where I've been. And it's true what I just told you. Everything's absolutely true. No telling how many. I can't even remember how many public schools I was in because of foster care. So, I mean, all that stuff weighs on your brain. No consistency. No discipline. You're taught by television. You're taught by evolutionists. You're taught by atheists. See, that becomes your father. Do you understand that? So then God's got to take somebody like that, save them, and then work on them. And so from 76 to 2007, I've got a little experience. 
So you can get help, even if I'm a little unapproachable at times. I may just be able to help you out sometimes. Three points. Things I've learned. Go to Romans 5.8. First thing I've learned in my life, and this is simplicity in simplicity, is according to Romans 5, and verse 8, God saves sinners. I mean, I've learned that this is, this is absolutely as simple as it is, this still works. In Romans chapter 5, and the reason why I pick 8 and not John 3.16 or something is because, because chapter of 5 and verse 8 is what really got me anchored. Because for years I thought I had to give up smoking, I had to give up dough. How am I going to talk to these people? I'm trying to lead people to learn and saying, well, I'd have to give up this and I'd have to give up that. And here I'd go, I'd try to convince them out of that. And then, then one other way, I, I'd try to put so much stuff on them where they won't get saved. And here over there in verse 8 of chapter 5, it says this, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet, what? Sinners Christ died for us. So when that devil says, you've got to do this, this, and the other thing, you just tell that devil, I just heard God tell me that He loved me in the condition that I'm in. I'm telling you, God loves sinners. He saves sinners. Once you know you're a sinner, then you need salvation. You need to get saved. It's just as simple as that. You can't say, but I still smoke. I no, it's, it's, it goes like this. Are you willing to come to Him as you are and get saved unconditionally? That's how you get saved. You don't say, because if you have to say, well, I'll have to give up this and I'll have to give up that, then buddy, you ain't getting saved. Because you're trying to make conditions now on Calvary. You can't do that. But he saves you as you are, whatever state you're in. God saves sinners. And I mean, that, that includes mankind. Look at verse 12. This is what it says. Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Somebody says, well, I'm not a sinner. Yes, you are. Well, you're not supposed to argue with them. Give them the word. Well, I'm not a sinner. Yes, you are. Quote him this verse. Or how about this one? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You can memorize that. Well, who said that? God said that. Well, you don't have to argue about it. You started it. You are a sinner. A hell-bound sinner. You need to get saved. And, and what's really neat, when you figure out verse, verse 8 of Romans 5, and you put this together, and you understand that God saves sinners, He knew all about me. Yet he loved me. Now you see, until you really start to think about yourself totally, get the whole concept of what a sinner you are, you can't really get the concept of his love. Because when you figure out how bad you really are, your thought life, your actions, and how you keep messing up and you keep messing up, and here God Almighty, the Holy God, loves you anyway. Whew. Anyway, that's one thing I learned. God saves sinners. Number two, God seals sinners. See, these, these three things I'm giving you today, if you get the depth of them, you'll get security. You see, because I was a doubting Thomas for years. Here, I went all the way through Midwestern Baptist College and didn't get heavy doubts till I was done with college. Somebody said, well, you need to get saved again. Well, God thought I already was. See, God thought I already was. He just wanted to get me to where I could trust and what the book said. And so I had to go through my little difficulties. And when I got a hold of this, God saves sinners. And then the second one, God seals sinners. I understood that sinners hear the gospel. Then sinners trust what they hear. And, ex and accept it as theirs. And that's belief. So all this stuff is milliseconds or whatever, twinkling of an eye stuff that takes place. You hear something, you hear the truth. You think about it, right? You have to think about it because you heard it. You trust what you hear. You say, yeah, that's right. And then in your heart of heart, you say, I believe that. Yeah, See, that's an acceptance. And when that takes place, guess what happens? You're sealed. Amen. Who says? Ephesians chapter 1. Now, why wouldn't a simple message like this excite you? It reinforces what you should already believe. And I mean, I mean, and God's even put it down letter perfect. So when anybody says, no, you got to do this to get saved. No, you got to do... No, no. This is what God says. And isn't it amazing it's in verse 13? 
Praise God. In whom, now look what it says, in whom ye also trusted. And, and if you're not sure about who's trusted and who did this, look at verse 12. This is Paul, right, that wrote this? It says that we should be, himself included with other Christians, to the praise of his glory. Who what? Who first what? Trusted in Christ. Didn't work for Christ. Didn't endure for Christ. But trusted in Christ. Now he's going to tell you exactly what happened verse 13. In whom ye also, talking to the Ephesians, did what? Trusted. Well, when did this happen? Look at the progression. After that you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you what? Believe it. You were what? Sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. What a verse, man. Well, I don't know what I did. That's what you did. Well, I don't know if I did it exactly like that. That's what you did, stupid. Except what the Bible says. See, see, why did Paul have to put that in there if you should already know it? He's talking to people in Ephesus that already say. He's, he's trying to put in words their experience. And the problem with us is we try putting everybody else's words into our experience. Now, this is the deal. You heard the gospel, bless God, and you fit the bill. You believe when God called you a sinner that you were. And when he said you needed a savior, he says, I do. You acknowledge that. And then you accepted it and received it in your heart. You said, Jesus, save me. And upon the word of God, God says you were sealed. So if he sealed you, where did he seal you? You don't know. I got some ideas, but you don't know. I told you before. Bless God, you go through so many doubts. If you knew it was in your eyeball, you'd, you'd, have, your, you'd have it super glued up so that you couldn't lose it. If you thought he came in that way. If it was your ear, you'd probably put plugs in it. Devil has you so messed up. No, you don't know where it's at. Because God knew you would try to pull something like that. Because you're human. Correct? But he sealed you. So if God Almighty sealed you, like Brother Earl says, that devil has wore out a whole lot of chisels trying to get that seal off. So you may feel the chisel beats on that seal. But your anchor still holds. Amen. So you may go through a whole lot of doubts and discouragements and everything. But the first thing that happens is something inside of you cries out, Daddy. And you talk to God. I like it. God saves sinners. God seals sinners. And then the last one, God uses scripture. And, and this person that I said I got in an argument with. He would say, yeah, brother, I'm saving. Notice your daughter, Joanna. He was messing with us, calling her Grace because she wore the Victory Baptist shirt, you know, with the grace and the believing and everything. And he says, I hope she don't take it offense or whatever. And we're going to rest of the death fine. And he starts talking to me. And next thing you know, he's in a predestination, right? And he's watching this lady named Scott on TV, okay? She wears a collar, you know, very smart, uses Hebrew and Greek. You see, and what he didn't know is I knew her old man before he died. See, he married her when she was like 15, I think. But her old man used to come on there and teach Bible with a cigar, you know, and a hat. And we lost a lot of people here through that hyper stinking grace junk. But anyway, so, and, and you know, and he's like this and everything's cool, you know. And that almost appealed to me because I figured this is neat. The guy's teaching Bible on nationwide cable and he's got a safari hat on, smoking a cigar in Bermuda's. And uh, very smart. I mean, he was knowledgeable, you know. But his wife comes on with a, with a purple thing with a white collar. And I'm saying, wow. Who, you know. Anyway, this guy, I'm finding out this is where he's getting his information. So, all I kept doing was trying to point him to Scripture. And they said, well, don't get loud. We're just talking now. You know, we shouldn't be. I says, brother, you ask me what I believe. Yeah. I'm pointing to a verse. Yeah. You're saying you don't want to go there. Right. That's why we got a problem. Yeah. Well, maybe one Sunday I'll come to your church. And I was almost praying, not this Sunday. But anyway, <laughs> he'll be here. I know it. It's the, I, know, I know what God does with certain people. Is. But, um, you know. And he's got a problem with all these different things in his life. I'm, it's all part of this because it's covering the last point about God uses Scripture. And if you don't get the proper structure when you're younger, you'll fall for every wind of doctrine. You'll be looking for everything new. No, look for something that's concrete and established. And bless God, the Holy Ghost has been blessing it. Don't mess with that stuff, man. In the end times, men will be giving heed 
to seducing spirits, to doctrines of devils. And they're all against what? The holiness of God. That means they give people too much liberty and leeway to do what they want to do. There's no discipline. There's no nothing. But anyway, so I'm talking to him. Go to John 17, 7. God uses scriptures. And, and you know, and I don't know if God was just putting that guy there to ruffle my thing up or, or if I'm supposed to help him. I tried helping him. I says, you know what? I says, buddy, with all the problems you got, you need to just go to intercessory prayer. And maybe God wants you to just be a prayer warrior. You know, just keep your mouth shut about everything else because you're a screwball. I didn't want to say screwball, but I said, maybe, I said, because you know, the right, the firm prayer rights man availeth much. I said, I know it's in the book of James, but you know what? I, I think you could help in prayer. And he goes, wow, brother, thanks. Maybe that's what I need to do. I said, I think that's what you need to do. Now, if he would not switch the station, you know, and hold that thought, it'd be okay. But I got a feeling he's, he's switching the stations. John 17, because I mean, who, who would want to go in a ministry like that? I mean, who pray? I mean, who really believes that? That that's a ministry. And that's a ministry of works. You know, praying is work. Just try doing it consistently for a month. Every prayer, let's just try, you know, being religiously affected by it. See how hard it is to go into prayer without having something to happen, get a phone call to make you do it. Just do it every day. It's an amazing thing. John 17, look at verse 7. I think this is it. Let me see. Or is it 717? Um, I think it's 717. Let me try. It's supposed to be three sevens. Oh, man. It's seventeen, seventeen. Thank you, brother. Yeah, that's the one. Good. Thanks. Before I got look stupid somewhere else. I look stupid in my own church. Yeah. Seventeen, seventeen. Now, is this the Lord's real prayer? If you want a blessing, you read John 17 over and over again. I'm serious. You just keep reading and say, God, would you speak to me through John 17? This is him in the garden, brother. This is him. Let this cup pass. Nevertheless, let my will, not thine. Uh, let, nevertheless, let thine will be done, not my will, something like that. Remember that one? Great drops of blood. This is him praying. Now, you'll hear our Father which art in heaven. That's, that's him teaching his disciples how to pray. I know uh, the Catholic Church and other people, religious people, have coined it as the Lord's Prayer, and some even sing it, and people cry and stuff. But the real Lord's Prayer is here. Yeah. This is him recording. He's talking to his Father. Yeah. And when you read this, you get around 20-something, you start figuring out that you're included in this, business picks up in your soul. You'll get excited about this. But him being here, if you can picture him on that rock praying, and all of a sudden... He says this, I'm telling you it's before his crucifixion. I'm telling you this is a deep and an earnest prayer. I'm telling you this verse means something. And when he says this, sanctify them through thy truth. And then he tells you what it is. Thy word is truth. And you're telling me I ain't got his truth and I can't get his truth unless I go eight years in Greek and Hebrew. You're out of your mind. He preserves his truth perfect. Ain't nothing he puts down not inspired. I thought about that. I said, my goodness. God uses scripture for what? For, for our separation. Where do you get that? From scripture. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says this, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Over in Second Peter chapter 1, and verse 4 says this, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What a thing, man. You say, what, what God uses Scripture for? For our growth. For our growth. That's why I caution you, and I caution us about ever going hyper. Hyper means that I can't use any of the promises in the Bible if it's to the Jew or something like that. In other words, God can't give me a good verse out of there. You've got to be careful how that works. Now, doctrinally speaking, he told the Jew, if this happened, this happened, he's going to do this for the Jew. He's going to do that. I'm not in there. I'm not Gentile. I'm Gentile. All right, I understand that. But if God all of a sudden threw those promises 
takes your mind and through the Spirit says, boom. I'm telling you what, you can take it to the bank. How do you know that? Past practice. How do you know that? From history. Many, many institutions, girls' home, boys' home, Christian colleges. Look at the verses that, 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 that affected the, the person that started them. A lot of times they're in the Old Testament. To the Jew. In the Jewish economy. Well, then that, that ain't going to fly. No, no, you're nuts. Because it does fly. And it does work. And one day you may need a promise and God will keep taking you somewhere in the Old Testament and you'll keep trying to reject it and pretty soon you'll reject your own blessing. God speaks through His Word. Oh, yes, He does. And so we see God uses Scriptures for our separation, for our growth. First Peter, since we're right here. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. The Bible says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Is that what it says? That's exactly what it says. Casting all your care upon him. When you cast that, that line out, that's how it is. You're whipping that thing out of you. Giving it to the Lord. And then also, I'll go to Matthew 11. I'll tell you, if you'd have got me about almost 30 years ago giving my testimony, you'd have got all the gory details. I had women squirming in the pews at East Steps Camp Meeting. Man, I had preachers cracking up. I mean, I had the vernacular of an alley cat. I would just tell them like it was. Amen. Somebody finally said, well, brother, you don't have to be that graphic. It's the grace of God. Almost sound like you liked doing what you were doing. I got to thinking about that. I said, yeah, it did sound a little bit like that. I have to trim it down a little bit, amen? Because after all, you give teenagers ideas, too. You give other people ideas if you make your sin. I think God saved me from getting high all the time and just having fun, not working, you know. And You know, the kid's saying, wow, well, I could try it, right? I mean, look what happened to him. God saved him. God got his act together. It ain't working for you. That's what I'm trying to explain to people in our church here. You got too much light. You better not be claiming preachers, grace, and mercy. <laughs> You're brought up in good homes, man. You got the gospel. You got all that stuff. God ain't going to be treating you as, as lenient. I'm telling you. I see it happen all the time. And on the other hand, you'll be able to do greater works than this preacher. I have saw people like Brother Saul, Brother DeMichael. I'm talking about preacher's kids. Second, third generation. They just got it. God's blessed them. Because they kept their hearts pure. They kept their minds uh, focused. And they didn't put the junk in their body like we did. And God blessed because of the parents' sacrifice and sticking by the stuff. So you always want your children to go up higher than you. Over here in, in uh, Matthew 11, in verses, uh, familiar verses, verses 28 and uh, 29. Now, God says, uh, cast your care, and, and what I like about 28 and 29 is these are true. I mean, verse 30, look what it says. Come on to me, all ye. So does, does that just mean the nation of Israel? See, so you've got to read Bible right. When you get over here, I mean, I, I've studied Matthew and everything, and I, I know, I know, I know, I know it's the nation of Israel. I know he came out of his own ownership, own but I also know towards the end of the book, he's leaning more to Gentiles, and then... Every book after that, he's going more, anyway, until you get to Acts, and then he's through with the Jews, and he's going with the Gentiles, amen? I mean, when you study that thing out, you'll see that. But when I look at verses, and it says, uh, for instance, like in the Psalms, sometimes it'll say, uh, to, to Israel. And then it'll go on and it'll say, and to all nations. Well, I just think that's to all nations, when he talks like that. So when I see here, it says, come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I believe that. And when he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. 
and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. My goodness. What is that? Well, God uses scriptures for our comfort. I know he does. For our comfort. Go to Psalms 37, 25. I feel like turning the air conditioner on here because it's too hot. I got a fan. You guys don't. You probably be passing out on me in a little bit. I mean, humidity outside. Good night. Some of you had to get up early. Some of you had to. You know, it's work driving on roads like that too. It's stressful. It'll wear you out. Deplete you of your vitamins and junk. Over here in Psalms 37 and verse 25. I have been young, and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Every point I'm giving you right now, I could preach 15 to an hour. Every point. Just from experience. Over here in Psalm 3725, we already talked about for our separation, for our growth, for our comfort. This is for your messed up environment. <laughs> in other words, where you're at right now, maybe where you're living, maybe your work situation, maybe... I'm telling you what, God has provided in our country. If you can't get a meal, there's something wrong with you. If you can't get you no clothes, you're lazier than the laziest. When you get to starving, you'll look for some food. And it's there. But if you're saved, God will take care of you. God takes care of you. Everyone in us. We had ten children. Went through all sorts of different things. We've always had clothes and you know we had food. And we still get food. Hallelujah. Good food. Man, I may not have my Cadillac or my Harley running. But I be eating shrimps and stuff. And pork tenderloin. And fruit. Man, God's taking care of my bills too. I mean... Mm. Ain't exactly like I would have had written it. Because your body does go through things when you don't trust them. You know, when you don't trust God, you get ulcers and everything. You get headaches. But I know this, that <laughs> for your messed up environment, he gives you a verse like that. I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. What does it mean? Exactly what it says. Exactly what it says. And then go to Psalms 27.10. As you grow in the Lord, you'll find out certain people you get counsel from, and pretty soon you'll be able to do things and look up things. It's just like everything else. A pastor, you use a pastor, I'm a service. I'm like a machine. A pastor, how should I study my Bible? I'll help you do that. Pastor, what do I do here over there? I'll, I'll tell you. I'll give you direction on how to pray. I really will. I'll give you scripture. I'll help you. And then pretty soon after a while, you'll be able to make those judgments. There's nothing wrong with that. That's why I'm here. <laughs> now, you can try to sit there and just figure it out. You know, it takes a little longer that way. But imagine half of us, if we would have just read the book of Proverbs, even if we weren't saved and believed what it said, how much stuff we wouldn't have done if we'd have believed it. But no, if you read the book of Proverbs, I told somebody the other day, I said, just circle every time you were the fool with red ink. So you know when you hit the book of Proverbs and you go through there and flick those 31 chapters and you see all that red, you'll say, mm-hmm, grace of God, mm-hmm, grace of God, oh boy, mercy of God, oh man. And you wouldn't dare do that stuff again. Why? Because now you're, you have a little wisdom. Now, how did you get that? Fear of the Lord. Where'd you learn that? Book of Proverbs. Well, what is Proverbs? Scripture. But anyway... Over here in Psalms 27, and I love this one. This has gotten me out of all sorts of things. In Psalms 27, look at verse 10, and don't forget this. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Mm -hmm. Not only for your messed up environment, but for your messed up parents. You know, your parents ain't perfect. And if the pastor says anything in it's scripture and it's right and your parents aren't doing that, you don't 
disqualify your parents. You don't dishonor your parents, but you go with the book. You're to grow up a notch. You're to do something that's a little bit better than that. Do you understand? When the Lord says he brought a sword, do you know he brought a sword? Do you know that eventually he would separate families? Imagine that. Families. The Lord would. Because he's mean? No. Because he's truth. So there's sometimes you just got to draw a line. You don't disrespect, you don't dishonor your parents. But when that the scripture says something, and you've got to do it, you do it. That's just the way you do it. And if you don't know your parents and have never had parental uh, upbringing, you can count on him. You can go to him. Right? When you feel lonely, maybe a father's dead, maybe a mother's dead, and you can't go to her anymore, you can't get comfort anymore. Go to him. And then eventually, when you get this thing thing together, that you are a son, and he is your heavenly father, then this verse really gets special. Because then you just go to him for everything. It just starts getting busy, busy, I'm telling you. So after looking at this, things I've learned, God saves sinners, God seals sinners, God uses scripture. Our life is to be pleasing to him. We are to glorify him. We must learn to be content. Got to learn. The scriptures will remove the murmuring and the complaining of baby Christians. The scriptures remove excuses from our vocabulary. They remove the victim attitude and give us a victorious one. How do you know? Because I'm no longer bad Bob. Bad Bob's been bought. Amen. By what? By the blood of Jesus Christ. Because of what? The blessed hope. So there's some good bees in the Bible. And I'm not the same because of this. So you see, when somebody says, I come from a broken home, I've lived up in a bad neighborhood, I've did all these things to my mind and my body. Yeah, so what? I want a little bit more compassion. Okay, Jesus died for you. Jesus has power. The Bible says you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. What do you think that means? That means the old man's dead. That means now to God the Father, you're his son. So what's the problem? See, if you narrow everything down and the excuses are gone, you can't blame nothing. You're back, you're back between you and your relationship with God. Period. You'll say, I keep doing this sin because I want to. You'll be honest. I want victory, I go to God. God gives me victory, praise God, I don't do that no more. Simple as that. It really is. It's elementary, my dear Watson. Amen? Boy, it's a sedate crowd today. My word. We're having a baptismal, not a funeral today. Amen. Amen. So what do you say to a message like that? Nothing. 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 You don't say nothing. You just have it recorded in your brain. Think about it for a while, and uh, maybe preachers preaching can help you. Really? Maybe I'm not a just a dictator. Amen? Maybe I'm a benevolent dictator. Maybe there's some love in there somewhere for you. Maybe when I see things and I preach on certain things, it's to get you to think about something to go a different way and not just to fight me. The proof is always in the pudding. Amen. Now, the worst thing you can get is like a lot of people out there right now. You know what they're praying for and hoping for? All my family to fail. Because they've got the concept that your preacher thinks he's perfect and what he preaches is perfect and his kids are just perfect. And I've never preached that. You can get any message in there. I will front my kids off. I will whip my kids. I will try to take care of my kids best I can. Now, the older I get, I'm getting the grandpa syndrome, so I'm getting slack. You know, so I am hoping they hurry up and get out before I get too weak, too mushy. I mean, it's bad. But good night. You're a parent, not a friend. You're a drill instructor, man. And if these kids don't get it, and if you keep them down, I'm telling you, when they get out in the world, can you picture your kids out in the world? Can you picture them in the world? Can you picture them 
having a backbone and strong and saying, no, I'm not going to do this. Or are they going to be weak and give in to everything? Well, where do they get that? The parents have to somehow say, look, man, you know what happens to boys? Girls get them in trouble. And you look at your girls and you say, boys get you in trouble. So what do you focus on? Your trades, your work. Why? Because one day you're going to meet a girl and you're going to be married. And my goodness, my grandkids are going to come up. So if your kids are weak here, what are the grandkids going to be like? I just don't know why they're breaking windows in my house. I don't know why they're unruly. Well, I wish my kids would do something. You didn't do nothing for them. Give them some backbone, man. Where do you get that? The book. Read the book. How do you know? I was a spoiled brat. Well, you survived. All right. You keep playing. That's why I'm almost convinced maybe most of them need to go into service. Some countries, that make them boys go into service. But they may die. Yeah, they may live too. Amen? They may get whooped where you couldn't do it. Have to know how to do teamwork. Be disciplined. Get up on time. Do things. Finish them. Set goals. I don't know. Why do you send your kids to a Christian college? Well, I do it to complement what I've given them. Because I know when they're there, if they finish the course, they're going to get some discipline. And they're going to look back and say, well, man, I wish Daddy was more disciplined. This is what works. He's so lazy and he's messed up like that. And Good. I hope they notice all that. Why? Because bless God, their kids will get up. They'll brush their teeth. They'll, they'll color within the lines. And they'll have a woman that will compliment them. And not whine. You're so hard. You're so tough. Be with my poor baby. See, you won't have that because the woman will know she'll bite her tongue. Because she'll know, because she knows her makeup. That's the way she is. And she'll let that man teach those boys how to be men and be responsible. See? But don't listen to me. Because even if I give you chapter and verse, you'll think I misinterpreted it. I'm just trying to help you. Amen? So guess what? If you're lost here today, you need to get saved. All right? I'm not even giving an altar call today. But you know you need to get saved. You need to see me after service, and I'll take my office and show you the Bible. Amen? If you're not right with God, just get right while we're baptizing. Amen? Okay? So that was bad Bob in a nutshell. That's the quickest I could put that out there. You know, so give me credit sometimes. Amen? All righty. So that's it. Glory to God. Isn't it good to be saved? Yeah. But I want a relief. I wanted to come to the altar. Well, this is what it's about. This ain't no.